making deposits and please look at this very carefully uh, time and love uh, they're not two things they're one thing uh, and we want to learn how we can make deposits emotional deposits in our spouse's emotional bank account understanding them so why we did this do you know your spouse do you know when they're happy when they're angry when they are sad because those are emotions at which time you can speak the love languages best so for example if your spouse is sad or upset and you know their behavior then you, if you know the love language you know what you can do at that time to love them but you know what it takes time it takes time it takes time in two ways number one it takes some time deliberate uh, planned time to understand your spouse's behaviors and if you are confused don't feel bad you can actually ask them okay you can actually ask them ah now so are you upset now they may be, if they upset they may say what, what are you asking me if i'm upset are you mad are you blind or what how long have we been married and you ask me if i'm upset you should know uh, let that go and then say no because i'm trying to find out what makes you angry now why you want to find out what makes them angry is so that you can love them and serve them but you have to give the time one like i told you time the first time is spending time and effort to discover your spouse's behaviors when they are sad when they are happy when they are angry when they are upset those kinds of things causes can come later but now what should you how should you react when you see they are in this state and the second thing in time and love is you are going to have to make plans how you're going to express your love to them once you know their mood their behavior and then you know their love language you know what you can do about it so for example if your spouse has the love language of uh, the touch then when you see them sad or upset or angry you know how to get them out of that you love them love removes a lot of the problems that human beings have the difficulty is we don't take the time to understand the love language of that person and then we don't take efforts to do something for them for example uh, now for this is this is really crazy okay now uh, several of you said when you are happy you cook okay now if you if your spouses want to make you happy what should they learn i've given you the clue learn some cooking it can be rubbish but the fact that you try to cook you are trying to talk their love language you are trying to communicate in their love language now they laugh because this is what happens in our family sorry to give you a confession because some of us can cook some of us can't cook it's a gift i think wouldn't you say <laughs> you're laughing <laughs> it is a gift yes there she agrees i'm so relieved not cooking is a gift yes not i mean some are not gifted to cook so what i'm saying is if i try to cook she is happy and touched even though she laughs like what is this you know but what i mean is i know that the fact that i tried to cook itself meant something because that is something that she wants as an act of service because for her act of service is a love language so part of the act of service is clean the house uh, wash the vessels cook the food do the washing you know what i mean this is just an example of know your spouse and i hope you took notes for that and then know their love language so that you can do it now how many uh, what can you do if your love languages match how many of you had the same love language as spouses how many had okay there you yeah so now that makes it easy you know why you can do something together if your spouse's love language is not the same as yours you still love them you serve them make the time make the plan to do something about it but if you both have the same love languages you can nicely join and do things when they match and what can you do if they don't match any ideas 
when your love languages don't match, it's going to take some uh, sacrifice. It is going to take some deep desire that you know what, even though for me this is not coming easily, I am going to do it. I'm going to do it. Okay. So that's what we want to keep. Let's go on. Uh, invest time at the emotional bank. And here it's where we are saying this important point. It is not all about emotions. A lot of the emotional power that we have comes in the form of actions. Uh, if you love God, you will obey His commands. So God measures love through obedience. Now, is obedience an emotion? Is obedience an emotion? It may produce an emotion, but obedience is actually doing something which somebody tells you to do. So clean the car. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Okay, I'll clean it. <laughs> you understand? Because God measures love by obedience. What we must learn to do is take out the emotion from our actions. What I mean is don't wait for the emotion to push the action. Because that is a very, very common behavior among human beings and sometimes even among those who are following Jesus. If I really feel I want to do it, only I should do it. Otherwise, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a fake. That is nonsense. When you, God says, love your neighbor as yourself, you may not feel like it. It may not be an emotional reaction. Somebody is having a problem. You, how do you love them? Go and help them in their problem. Now, you may not feel any emotion there. You may not think, but I don't feel so spiritual. I don't feel like God is there touching me or talking to me. You go and do it because you're obeying God. Emotions might come afterwards. They may come, they may not come. We don't know where. For different people, they may come. For some, it may not come at all. But that's not the important point. The point is, emotional bank account, you can fill up someone else's emotional bank account by understanding them and understanding their love languages and then making actions in their love language. So, if it is uh, words of affirmation, words of affirmation, learn to do that. Now, for, for me, that is not a uh, love language. So if you come and tell me, uh, sir, uncle, uh, brother, you are a wonderful person and all that, I don't at all, it doesn't get recorded. I mean, I, so, so they, they come and tell you nice things about yourself. Yeah, I think so. But what I mean is, it's not my love language, so uh, you are not going to stir me up if you tell me nice things about myself. Same way. If you say you are the world's most stupid person and you are not fit to do that, also it will have no effect. I won't go off in depression. Oh, they said I'm a stupid fellow. Why I'm stupid? What's wrong with me? I don't know. Nothing. It will bounce off tomorrow morning. I'll look at you and say, hello, how are you? It's not because I don't. It is not my love language. Words of affirmation are not my love language. So you can't make me happy. You cannot love me with that. And you cannot hate me with that also. So I've got like, uh, regarding words, now there are other things. If my, one of my love languages is acts of service. So if you really say, you know, what do you need? Uh, you know, you look very busy or something. What do you need? Ah, this person loves me. You see, we interpret love by the actions of the other person in our love language. And the only reason we looked at know your spouse, you know, when they're happy, because those are the times when we can love them. Now, this is all about couples, but I'm telling you, even single people can learn a lot from this because you can find out about other people, how to love them, how to serve them. Okay, so plan a weekly time to speak your spouse's love language and ask your spouse if you're learning well. So, um, was it nice this evening? I mean, when we went for the movie, you know, uh, only thing you always choose these type of movies <laughs> so next time okay 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 so i have to ask her what movie also not just movie which movie because they may like certain stars and not certain others so you've got to go so far okay uh, let's go on uh, so i think i'm getting an idea about that you know know your spouse understand their love languages and uh, take time take time make a plan please I hope you wrote down, spouses, what you are going to do every week 
choose the time and the day and you may say no but i want it to be a surprise i want to just do it specially it must be spontaneous it must come i will tell you this i've been married longer than any of you in this room you know surprises and spontaneity will, will send the marriage for one one month what is much more required you'll come to find out if you want it to last for a long time and be happy for a long time spontaneity and all is highly overrated in relationships there's another c word which is going to come which you will learn okay so now uh, become your spouse's biggest fan point number 3 and that is uh, spend time to become friends you've done that a lot so what about uh, sending compliments to them sometimes when a person says something to you you don't realize how other people are thinking about you that's why this is very valuable because oh i didn't know people think about me like this i didn't know people love me like this so it's good to know that so uh, do this a lot do this a lot why don't you uh, make a plan spouses uh, once a day to send however very small message because whatsapp is now so easily available why don't you just do that uh, i know we send funny things and we send videos and somebody will send us something that also you can do but do something personal from your heart say something even if it's uh, le- even if it's one sentence or less plan to do that every day at least once and you know i'll tell you uh, men if you have a problem like me you have to fit fix the time yes i'll do it tomorrow next question what time tomorrow ah uh, about 11 no 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 11 then you put a reminder on your phone these are the actions which actually build our relationships uh, the other big one in uh, becoming your spouse's biggest fan if you really want to be your spouse's fan you're going to have to do this forgiveness business this is a tough one and if you watch carefully friends can forgive each other more easily very often than spouses we don't think of our spouse as our best friend if we can only learn to make our spouse our best friend forgiveness will come much easily much more easily but we sometimes and this does not apply to everybody very often in marriages sometimes it is a power play a power play you know uh, a man if i am a real man i must control her if she does not do what i want there is a problem in our marriage this is quite common maybe a little more in our culture than other cultures but if she doesn't do what i want then there's a problem in this marriage and so then the behavior after that will be problem in the marriage this woman is a problem this woman is a problem how do i get her to submit how do i force her to love me and serve me you see do we do that with our friends we don't do that with our friends do we look at our friends think of your uh, what i mean same gender same sex friends do you think about controlling and all that no we have fun together we we just go out and hang out and we do this we, we don't talk about control i must make them do what i want do we do that with our friends we don't in fact we'll ask them what they want to do na real friend we'll ask them what would you like come let's go to the beach Oh, let's go for this movie. I may not like the movie, but I like my friend, so I'll go over and sit in the theater for two and a half hours. You know, why is it in marriages we don't see each other as friends? The best marriages are when the couples are each other's best friend. You should be able to look at your spouse and say, "You are my best friend," because then forgiveness. And that's why we are saying, move from spouse to friend. think about your spouse as your best friend how would you behave with your best friend forgiveness will come much more easily because if you don't forgive there's something wrong with the love uh, what do you do after you forgive after you forgive not after you ask forgiveness when you have forgiven it doesn't matter men or women after you forgive what do you do sometimes honestly when you forgive this is a very important biblical teaching when you forgive you are actually becoming free because you are releasing that person and yourself from the prison it's when you don't forgive you are putting yourself in a jail and you are trying to put them also in a jail so forgiveness is the secret 
to serenity and a very, very peaceful, happy life and a great thing for relationship. So don't hold on to any grudge. Forgive, you are making yourself free. When you forgive, you are saying, I'm not in this uh, jail of bitterness and anger and revenge. I'm getting out. And so in that sense, I will say uh, Mitran and Juliet should be the star couple in that. You know, because that is actually, they are very free. They are set free. Jesus came to set us free. So that all bitterness and are they going to change? Have they really repented? Uh, I will see and check. And if they do this again, I'll blow my top. How many times? Remember the famous uh, unmerciful servant parable? Peter came to Jesus and asked, how many times should I forgive? Hmm? Should I forgive uh, up to seven times? Because in the normal Jewish culture, three times is enough. A person hits you three times, you can be quiet. Fourth time, give them. Don't take it. That was, and so Peter thought he was being very spiritual. Up to seven times. Pharisees taught only three times you forgive. Seven times. Jesus said 77 times or 770 times. That is, what is this counting the forgiveness? What is this counting whether they are changing, whether they are repenting? That is not for me to do. That person has to answer God if they are not changing, if they are not uh, you know, repenting and if they are not altering. I am only asked to forgive. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Did, does God forgive you like this? And couples, remember this okay, when you get angry and you want to punish the person and you want to make them not do that again. Because we have all these funny agendas sometimes. Please look at Jesus and then see how much did he say okay I'll forgive you let's see how many times you will sin 200 times then out do you think Jesus does that for us we know it's not true why do we do that to each other why do we make forgiveness so expensive for the person we are forgiving we'll make you pay you must realize what you did no who should really make us realize what we did? God. Tell me if I'm wrong. I think a Christian couple, both are wanting to be holy. I don't think you will ever get, uh, if you talk to your spouse, uh, do you want to be just like Jesus or do you want to be holy? I think everybody will say yes. Then why do we have the problem? It is because we struggle due to our personalities, our backgrounds, our different uh, experiences we've had in our life. That is why we do this peculiar way of treating other people. And so that is why loving and accepting is probably the single strongest way to bring change. It's what makes you repent is the love and forgiveness of God. And what, why do we repent again and again and again? Because he still got his arms open. He didn't say, As this much I can do after that, go away. So that's what I think we have to give. If husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church, there is no measuring how many times did I forgive you. If you still remain like that, will I keep on forgiving you? As far as we know, the gospel is saying the forgiveness just flows and flows and flows. That's what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper. Still forgiven. I am forgiven. Am I perfect? No. We are not perfect, but we are forgiven. And so I think our spouses must... And you know, this is more powerful to make us change. When I know someone loves me, I try to behave better. When I know someone is going to beat me, I will behave better when I see the stick. You know that, no? When I'm afraid of punishment, I'm only afraid when the punisher is there. And after they are not there, that You know? But when I love somebody, whether they are there or they are not there waiting with a stick, I want to. And I think God is looking at the heart. Do you want to love? Do you want to forgive? Do you want to receive forgiveness? Do you want to give forgiveness? It's the small things, but consistently. Then a picture starts forming in your spouse. I am important because he knows me. He knows my love language. He knows what I like, what I don't like. And little, little, not perfect, but they, if their spouses see one step, trying to do it, trying to do it, trying every day. We all know when we're learning how to swim, you don't get it in the beginning, but what it is, 
I will keep on doing it. Artificially, I have to breathe and I have to move my arms and I move my legs. Why? Because I want to become a great swimmer. In the beginning, it looks very artificial. It is not enjoyable. So in our uh, communications with one another, please, spouses and all of us, this is a wonderful thing which we can learn, take little steps every day, do the same boring thing. After some time, a picture starts to form in your spouse's mind. I am important for him. He cares about me. That is why every day at 4 o'clock he sends that message. And then in the morning he gets up and he first doesn't go for the phone. He says, you know, how are you? Did you sleep okay? It may look as if you're not really caring whether she slept okay or not. But I tell you, you start saying, how are you? Did you sleep okay? It will be like a machine for one month. Watch after one month. She'll say, yeah, I want to tell you something. How did you sleep? Mm, not so good. You see how a relationship develops. Don't ever believe this lie that doing something artificially without spontaneous and without big feeling is the way we should do it. No, step by step. Every day, little things to build, okay? Let's go on to the next one. And this is a very simple point. Uh, you need to write it in because you've got nothing written, but you will see it coming up. Uh, the divine family order, because we are moving to families now. Here again, we want to move very quickly and we will try and finish up in the next 10 minutes. The divine family order, uh, the first starting place is God. So if you, and you need to write it down so you never forget this. Uh, this is how God has ordered families to be. God is the starting place. God is the starting place. Step two is the husband and wife. We need to get this order very carefully because sometimes it leads to problems. Husband and wife. And I put it in a different color only so that you will understand the role. We are talking now about husband and wife and family. Third one, children. Fourth one, parents and in-laws. And fifth one, other. This is the divine pattern, the divine family order for family. God, it all comes from God, but husband and wife comes from God. That's the starting place, that's the foundation. After that comes you to each other. You are the most important people in life. Husband, look at your wife and say, you are the most important person on this earth for me. That is God's commandment. Husbands look at wife, wife look at husband. You are God's most important person on the earth for me. Then only come the children. The reason we say this is because sometimes children start taking the place of the spouse in our love and affection. And we justify not treating the spouse correctly by saying because of the children. I have to take care of the children. That's why I cannot say to you. The child must always see that for you, your spouse is number one. Like one person said it very, the best gift you can give to your children is to love their mother. The best gift you can do for your children is to love their mother. Wives, the best gift that you can give to your children is to love their father. The moment you let the, and I'm spending a little time on this because very often we use the children as the buffer, as the excuse, as the reason why, that's why I cannot see to him and all that. Because now that the children have come, my, oh, my life is going here only. You will have to, that's why we are saying, take that one day off, two, three hours, arrange something for them. It will take money, we'll have to get one baby, I will have to take and drop her in my mother's house. How can we do that? Believe me. It, you are doing it God's way. You are doing it God's way. No, 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 we cannot do that. You don't take care of your spouse, you are hurting your children. You are hurting your children. But you can set it right. So please keep that in mind. Husband and wife, your first responsibility is to God, we know that, and then to each other. Then only come the children. If the husband and wife are not very strong, the children are doomed. Many of us grew up in families like that, no? 
we can all we all can testify not now but you know where our parents were not great and the things that in that way were not well it has a terrible effect on the children in their emotional life in their physical life in their spiritual life it's it just a terrible thing and so and then please keep the parents and in-laws after the children because very often we will say grandparents that's why i put parents and in-laws because we are talking about husband and wife please don't bring your parents or your wife's parents more important than your children that's not god's plan that's not god's plan we can have a long bible study about that where do grandparents fit in the family uh, order god husband and wife children then only come parents and in-laws brother in law sister in law even if they are paying for the children's education because this is very often used no 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 we have to do what my mother says she gave 5 lakhs for the uh, capitation fee and all the deposit for the school and my child's future is going to be in that number one school you can tell what i think about this you know the way i'm talking and stuff uh, my child's future will be first class in that school and so I have to tell him he has to go to the grandmother's house every day where did this nonsense come from not from god not from god i'm speaking strongly because this is quite common we destroy families by importing what god said should not be there and we come and put them on the throne in our lives no 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 you please keep them in their correct place god's place god will bless everything correctly and then others so everyone else comes after that this is the order which god has designed families okay go on to the next one uh, building commitment we spoke about this a little earlier uh, manage your emotions that's a big issue in families managing emotions keep keep in mind our emotions don't correspond to god's reality i may feel something she may feel something but that is just our feelings that is not actually the truth truth is what god says is correct okay and so therefore we must control our emotions by god's agenda and priorities what does god say is important god says love your spouse whether you feel like it or not god only said that he didn't say if you feel love your neighbor if you feel love the lord your god look at the great commandment love the lord your god love your neighbor as you love yourself he didn't say if you feel it how did we make this if you feel it as a condition for loving and serving others how did we bring our emotions and make our emotions the uh, what do you call it the fulcrum the you know what i mean no the the uh, well, your feelings your feelings matter and this is a certain amount of secular stuff which is coming feelings matter feelings matter but my my spouse's feelings should matter to me my feelings should matter to my spouse my feelings should not matter to me this is god's agenda if i will take care of my wife's feelings guess what my feelings will be fine because god has arranged it like that he didn't say you first see to yourself then you can see to others no first you love the lord your god and love your neighbor as you love yourself it's taken for granted so uh, look at common common family emotional reactions and you know watch carefully on this uh, because we're going to talk about this in great detail in november and that is communication because these are all the foundation for communication and the connection between what we are talking about in commitment going on to communication because how do you express anger anger is a common family emotional reaction we have to learn how to express anger anger does not disappear after you love somebody you may get angry at god you get angry with other people you get angry with your wife you get angry with your children children get angry with their parents so anger does not disappear when you become a believer we have to learn how to handle anger note this because we will repeat this slide next time because we have to identify where our, is our problem how to manage anger second is criticism watch how you give criticism and how you receive criticism third is withdrawal withdrawal emotional withdrawal physical withdrawal spiritual withdrawal you know where you just pull away and i won't talk to anyone i'll be like this only what to do uh, fourth is silence now many of you spoke about silence and withdrawal there is a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it and then the fifth one is control and manipulation these are the common reactions within families you know what destroys families i think you can see this 
when we are not taking care of one another. Learn the love languages, know your spouse. That's the best work you can do to build your family. It starts with the husband and wife. It doesn't start with the children. It doesn't start with the parents. It starts with them. What did they do to repair their marriage? Somebody has to take a step. It doesn't always have to be both. In a covenant, one person will take the step. And so he takes the step. And he tries very hard. And then it was only, then finally it came, only God could do it. And he said, I wish I could say all the prayers and all that, but it's actually, yeah, that may be, but God is the one who had to do it. Now, what I would say is we won't have time to do that today. We want to set up an accountability partnership here, okay, for both marrieds and singles, where we'll say two, two couples, just for an example, I'm only saying, like say, uh, Anand, Esther, and Clement and Twyla, where they will pray for each other every day. That's, that's all we want to do, is specifically on this, okay? We want to set up an accountability system. Also with the singles, uh, you know, we'll say men to men and women to women, we won't cross at all. So you please take up one another and start praying very, very specifically that they will understand their love language, that God will give them the wisdom to choose rightly when they are going to get married. Those are the things which you need to do. And so this is a kind of an assignment for you at home. Uh, please write three ways that you can do to build your family. You decide what you're going to do to improve your family life. Because see, when there are children, please make time for the children. Making time for the spouse, make time for the children, where you only are going to do things for the sake of the child. Don't think that you're going to spoil them. Do that because that is what they needed. Then only that will give you the, build, the bridge to build and talk about other more serious things. Uh, go on to the next, uh, next slide. We have only two more. And uh, one is we are calling it repairing family conflict. These are steps that we can take. They are all written for you. Uh, you won't have any difficulty. The first one is think and ask if there is a problem, if the issue is worth fighting over. Whenever you have some issue with your spouse or your children, ask if this is so important that you have to fight about this. You have to make a big noise about it. Because many things you can just leave off. You know, do that. Number two, don't confront in temper. Cool off so you can talk calmly. These are all very simple, ordinary things. But this is where, when we pray for each other, these are the things we want to pray about. Okay. Third is, fix a mutually agreeable time to talk. When you have to talk about something serious, Make sure that you ask the other person, is this okay for you? Mutual. Both sides must agree to that. Four, learn to listen. Learn to listen. Don't always think that you understand the problem. Sometimes we, have, we find out this, that what the spouse is saying, I didn't even know that. I mean, even we did it a little humorously. One said, I had no idea that when she gets upset, she becomes quiet. I thought she just wanted to go to sleep. I didn't know she was upset. You know, we have this. So listen, because sometimes they can tell us things we don't know. Keep in mind that the idea is to resolve the conflict, not win the argument. Ego, power play, drop out. That does not, that does not belong in a marriage. And finally, avoid forcing your views and ways, because you are not God. Okay? You are not God. And then finally, uh, we want to just summarize uh, the whole thing, what we have done, and what we want to do is, uh, you can see, let's go through very quickly, become your spouse's biggest fan, learn the love languages, we we'll keep reminding you, don't worry, uh, become your spouse's biggest fan, compliment and forgive, these are the two things we've learned today. Third is the divine family order, then managing your emotions, which we'll do in great detail when we speak about communication. And then de-stress your family, that is resolving conflict. And finally, repair conflict, okay? De-stress your family by not doing things that will make it bad. Take out the family stress. You know what is causing a problem, don't do that. And do things that will build your marriage. Finally, what we ask you to do is, as couples, please make this covenant with each other.